Today is a day about universes. There are three issues we want to address. Coercion in the universes, composition in the universes, and univalence. The first issue is coercion. We can simply do nothing as in the natural number type. For the remaining two issues, we are going to solve them by the glue types. The glue types are like the formal compositions in the universe, except that they are taking equivalences instead of paths as walls. So the E here is an equivalence between some type T and the bottom type A under the constraint phi. We are going to write this type as glue, taking this box as the parameter. You can think of a glue type as a combination of univalence and homogeneous composition. It's like using the univalence to turn equivalences into paths and then compose the box into a new type. Other variants of cubical type theory have separate type constructors for composition and univalence instead of just the glue types. Either way works, and we will focus on the glue types today. A glue type, like any other type in the cubical type theory, should also support homogeneous composition and coercion. These two operators turn out to be the most challenging. When people are complaining about the universes, they are lamenting about the count operations of the glue types. Before diving into the count operations, let's discuss the elements of a glue type first. There is only one constructor called glue in a glue type. The glue constructor takes two arguments, the partial element in T under the constraint phi and the total element in the bottom type that agrees with the image of the partial element, judgmentally. The partial element is like the boundary of the box. The eliminator is called unglue which projects out the bottom element from an element in the glue type. So the new syntax includes capital glue, glue, and unglue. Let's go through the formal rules more carefully. The first one is the formation rule. Suppose there is a type A and a partial type T that is equivalent to the type A under the constraint phi. The glue type is a type. Moreover, is judgmentally equal to capital T under the constraint phi. The next one is the introduction rule. Suppose there is a partial element T of the partial type capital T and an element in the bottom type that agree with the image of T under the equivalence. We can construct elements in the glue type as shown. Moreover, under the constraint phi, it equals to T. This type checks because the glue type is judgmentally equal to capital T under the constraint phi. Next, the eliminator unglue will give you the bottom, which agree with the image of the partial elements under the equivalence. We do not need the projector for the partial elements because the element U in the glue type is already judgmentally equal to the partial element under the constraint phi. The equality also explains why the bracket at the end of the judgment has u directly. Now we know the constructor and the eliminator. They work together as expected. The eliminator will project out the button, and we can rephrase every element using the glue constructor. So we just answered all the basic five questions about a type. Before moving to the count operations of the glue types, let's make sure we can derive both composition and univalence. For composition, suppose we have a box in the universe. We can consider coercion along paths, which is always an equivalence, then construct the solution using the glue type. You need to flip the coercion direction because the equivalence is from top to bottom while the box is from bottom to top. For univalence, 
Suppose we have an equivalence between A and B. You can form a path from A to B by using the identity equivalence on the right-hand side. The top line given by the group type is a path from A to B. This means the group type gives us a univalent universe. So the group type, if working, indeed solves our problems. I hope you are ready to check out their count operations now. Let's start with the homogeneous composition. The box is from left to right, where the starting phase is M, and there is one wall N in the back. Remember that every element in the group type is a partial element in the top and the total element in the bottom. These are the actual data you have, a line in the back, a point in the front, and an L-shaped partial element in A. What you want is two points in the top and the line in the bottom at the other end. You need to pick the points in a way that agrees with the composition in the front face. The composition and coercion in the group type are so tricky because they have to agree with individual compositions and the coercions in different components of the group type. Each component within a group type is adding a new constraint. So how can we implement the homogeneous compositions that satisfies all the constraints? First of all, we know the points need to agree with the compositions in each wall. So we start with individual compositions. We need the entire line, not just the result of the composition on the right-hand side, so that we can do homogeneous composition in the bottom. Next, we can project the new lines down to A. Finally, we can do a homogeneous composition to construct the bottom line constrained by the projection of N and the lines from step 1. And then we are done. Let's move on to the coercion. We added two walls to the group type to demonstrate the subtleties in the coercion. You have a line on the left, and you want to coerce the line to the other side. Again, you should look into the actual components of the elements in the group type. The starting line is a line in the top and a line in the bottom. What you want is a similar combination on the other side. Moreover, each part of the coercion should agree with the coercion in each part of the group type. The parts that support the coercion are the equivalences in parallel with the coercion dimension. We can describe the shape of group by the logical expression phi that is the disjunction of i equals to 0, i equals to 1, j equals to 0, and j equals to 1. We care about the last two walls, which are in parallel with the dimension i. We will see how to calculate the sub-expression mechanically later. Let's trace the coercion algorithm step by step. You start with an element on the left. The first thing is to coerce the top elements to the right and we need the whole lines to complete further fixes as in homogeneous composition. This is similar to the first step of homogeneous composition. Next, we will calculate the projection. Then, we will do the composition in A. We need heterogeneous composition because type A may depend on the coercion dimension. Now, because we have an equivalence on the right, one can exploit the inverse function to obtain a line in the top. This relies on two facts. First, fibers of an equivalence are contractible. Second, you can always extend a partial element to the whole element in a contractible type. The elements from step 1 form a partial element in the fiber, and from these two facts, we can extend them to cover the entire area. The last problem is that infertility is only up to some path, but the bottom line needs to agree with the image judgmentally, so we cannot use the bottom line from step 2 directly. 
we need to do another homogeneous composition to fix the bottom line. Hmm. If you're looking into the diagram carefully, you might wonder why we cannot just use the image of the green line directly. In what way a homogeneous composition can help us? To see the value of another composition, you need to go up by one dimension and consider a more complicated situation where the bottom line is actually a square. I often say you need a four-dimensional fission to appreciate the cubical universes. So the square has some parts constrained by the projection of the coerced elements from step one. Step three, in this case, will find you some parts in the top, but their projection will match their corresponding parts only up to a path. So you genuinely need a homogeneous composition to compose our first approximation from step two with adjustment paths from step three. There might be some distortion due to homogeneous composition, but as long as we match all the constraints judgmentally, we are safe. We have completed the coercion algorithm. Let's revisit how to grab the faces in parallel with the coercion dimension. We write the parallel part as for all i dot phi. The intuition is that if some parts exist for every i, then that part is independent of i, which means the phase is in parallel with the dimension i. The formal definition of the for all i operator is to send equations i equals to 0 and i equals to 1 to false. For example, for all i dot phi is j equals to 0 or j equals to 1. All right, you can already construct a working glue type based on what I've told you, but there are a few more things I want to mention. The first point is that the algorithms have been further optimized to reduce unnecessary compositions in common cases. Well, technically speaking, it complicates the most general cases, but significantly simplifies common cases such as univalence. Agda adopted the optimization. The second point is that I actually lied to you. The coercion can take a dimension expression psi that freezes certain parts of the starting element, but it will only handle the case where psi is zero. We do not have to change the algorithm much. You can implement the freezing by imposing suitable constraints in each step. If you are curious about the four technical details, I just updated the course website to include more relevant papers. The paper about cubical acta and the notes written by Simon Huber has all the details. Finally, I want to review the implementation of univalence using the optimized glue type. It's common to coerce an element along a line created by the univalence. It will be coercion around the U shape, which will be applying the equivalence on the left, followed by the coercion in the bottom, and then the identity function on the right. Note that this is not judgmentally equal to just applying the equivalence on the left, even if the bottom type B is constant along the coercion dimension. The coercion is not an identity function. Why can't we force the coercion to be an identity function? After all, it type checks and seems to make geometric sense. The answer is that we only know how to impose this condition on every type if there were no univalence. The main difficulty, as you can guess, is the glue types we talked about today. The condition is called regularity and has been the center of a few lines of research in cubical type theory. Anyways, we have a working cubical univalence type theory with restored harmony. We will discuss its metatheoretic properties next week. For now, stay well and stay safe. Bye.